Welcome to the Principles of Performance podcast, where we discuss how to optimize your health, fitness, and performance. Drawing on decades of experience of working as coaches, consultants, and trainers to top performers, athletes, and teams from professional sports to top universities to the U.S. military, Eric Degatti and Mike Perry discuss topics and strategies of how to perform at your highest level and be your very best. Join us and our friends and colleagues who are leaders in the fitness and performance industry as we investigate and challenge the most popular training, nutrition, lifestyle, and recovery protocols. go here we are with the principles of performance podcast i'm your host eric degatti along with my friend and co-host mike perry mike we're gonna have to jump right into this one because we got a, a really good guest here we got a lot to cover yeah we have a lot of information to cover so uh why don't you go ahead uh do a quick bio and we're gonna get this thing rolling all right so uh, i'll make this as quick as possible because if i did his whole bio it would take up the entire show but we have dr christopher ahmad a uh, man of many talents serves many roles including uh, professor of clinical orthopedic surgery at Columbia University. Um, he's also a chief of sports medicine director of biomechanics research uh, there, but he's also known as the head team physician for the New York Yankees, the Rockland Boulders. Um, and he's done a bunch of different things involved with uh, Major League Baseball and the Team Physicians Association, as well as we got to, to know each other through working together on an initiative called the Baseball Health Network, which promotes the health of, of young throwing athletes. And then he also has a book called Skill, which I highly recommend for anybody who's a listener, whether you're a health, any type of health practitioner or coach, learning like what skill is, how to acquire it, and how to refine it. It's, it's the book you got to read. So I'm very excited to have a, an old friend, uh, Dr. Christopher Ahmad with us. Welcome, Chris. Hey, thank you, guys. I am so excited to be with you. All right. So before we get into the discussion of sports injuries, let's quickly focus on time management. All right. And and how do you handle all the things that you're involved with at such a high level? Yeah, great question. And uh, I sometimes feel that uh, there's more things I want to do in this world that I have time for. And I bet a lot of people feel that way. Uh, the The key to time management for me comes from sports and that is you need a great team to help you with everything you want to do and that team exists in your work life just like it would be on an athletic field how does that help you with time management let's say i want to get through a whole bunch of patients in an office day my team allows me to get through it and i can give you more details about that how do i assist with the yankees there's a whole medical team surrounded by the health care of the yankees on the performance side, on the medical side, and it's a coordination of effort that makes efficiency and productivity. So if you're not working in your team uh, or with a team atmosphere and you feel like you wanna get more done, you gotta get some people on board with you to coordinate efforts. It's a synergy, it's one plus one equals five, and that's how things start to really work. Well, yeah, absolutely. I'm sure it's, uh, you know, something like that. Um, it can be tough and challenging because, you know, at the highest level, there can always be egos, whether it's players or people in general. So I'm sure that can be challenging, but it seems like you guys are doing a, a really, really good job with that. But we're going to switch gears. So uh, UCL injuries, ACL tears, uh, this stuff is is basically uh, on the rise and it's absolutely crazy. Um, you know, can you give us a sort of an overview on what you feel is the, the major, major big rocks as to why? Well, Mike, great question. And I, I would like to just pause for a second and reflect that this year, 2024, is the 50th year anniversary since the first UCL reconstruction that we all know as Tommy John surgery. So uh, one incredible journey this has been in sports medicine. And uh as a physician who specializes in Tommy John surgery, uh, my practice is busier and busier every year. And it's because UCL injuries are happening more frequently. It's an epidemic, so to speak. And it's happening in every age category from the professional athletes to the college athletes, to the adolescent high school athletes. 
when I first started uh, 15, 20 years ago, it would be professional and college kids coming in. Now I saw just this week a 14-year-old with a complete UCL tear, 14 years old. It used to be you were 30 when you got this injury. So let's talk about why that is. I studied mechanical engineering as an undergraduate student at Columbia University. And so it's been my goal and aspiration to study why ligaments tear and how we can get better at preventing it and of course, fixing it. And so talking about it with you is also special because the biggest impact we have in understanding and preventing UCL injuries comes from parents and coaches. And I used to spend my time teaching other surgeons how to fix UCL injuries and all, uh, all kinds of patterns and injury patterns. Uh, now, in terms of prevention, the best thing is working with parents and coaches because they have the biggest influence on our players. All right, so why does it get hurt? With that is the preamble. This UCL is a ligament that holds the two bones of the elbow, the forearm and the upper arm together. And when you throw, you put massive force on your elbow. The force of the ligament, which is holding the two bones together like a rope, has so much force on it that it just wants to snap. And as our athletes will term issue number one, pre-professionalization, that is early professionalization. These younger kids are training like professionals. They're getting bigger and stronger and they're throwing harder. Velocity is mathematically related to the amount of stress on the ligament. So while the goal of baseball pitchers is to throw with higher velocity, that equates to more stress on the ligament. <clears throat> and while you can grow your body, you can get your bones stronger, you can get your muscles stronger, you can throw harder, you can only marginally increase the strength of your UCL. So this poor UCL is not able to keep up with all the demands that are happening around baseball. So I, I feel like pausing there, but I'm not going to. I'm going to tell you a little bit more. It used to be the high-level athlete, then the college athlete, then the high school athlete that we see these injuries on, and they used to be pitchers primarily. Then it became pitchers and catchers. Then it became pitchers, catchers, and outfielders, and now it's infielders that are getting this injury by throwing across the diamond. And because velocity is so important, we have so many metrics around baseball. We measure throwing velocity in infielders and they work on their velocity and their grip and their four seam control to get an accurate throw to first so aggressively that they're tearing your UCLs also. So right now you get big and strong early you start throwing harder at an earlier age. You're exposing your ligament to so much stress. You can't get your ligament stronger. That's the primary factor. If you want me to keep going, I'll name issue number two. Absolutely. Issue number two, which we already said a little bit, is velocity. It used to be volume, year-round baseball, never take a break, don't sport diversify. You commit to baseball early on. You don't play basketball or other sports in the winter. You play baseball year-round. That is definitely up there on the list. But you know what just exceeded it? The quest for velocity. Velocity is king in this sport. So the work that people do with velocity enhancement puts their ligament at an undue amount of stress, and that's equating to higher levels of injury. And we all know about these velocity programs. I love to hear your thoughts on it. There's weighted ball, put more stress on your elbow so that you can develop more velocity. And we can talk about how it actually works. There's run and gun. Have you heard of the velo slap? Yeah, oh, absolutely. I mean, that's I like, haven't seen it personally, but that's what people are talking about because I'm not in that training environment with these athletes of that age category that are doing it. But Eric, go ahead and tell us what a velo slap is. So when you got to get really juiced up and, and it even carries over to the weight room, a good velo slap is spreading out the palm and, and really giving somebody a nice 
red five finger slap right across the middle of the, between their scapula. And obviously there's that pain reaction gets the juices going, gets the nervous system ramped up. So maybe they get an extra tick on, on that running gun or whatever it is, which at the end of the day, nobody cares except for that post on Instagram that comes right after the, the velo slap. Yeah. Amazing. So people want to get slapped in the back to get a little more adrenaline pump going so they can do as much force through their elbow as possible. And uh, there's something about uh, baseball that uh, velocity is king. That's how it is. And if your velocity isn't at a certain margin, it's going to be a come up problem. It used to be that having a player on your major league roster that was in games that would throw 100 miles an hour was a spectacle. Like you'd want to see this guy throw 100 miles an hour. Now every team's got players that throw 100 miles an hour and players being plural. Like right now in the Yankees, we have several players that hit 100 miles an hour. Many of them, of course, have had Tommy John surgery already. So I got a bunch of questions coming off of this one, Chris. We actually had a similar conversation with obviously somebody you know real well as Eric Cress, who was on the show. And I said, have we gotten almost too good at what we do in the strength and conditioning where we can build so much strength and power that the body just can't handle 120 mile an hour exit velocities? They can't handle running at the speeds that we're running at and cutting at the at the velocities that we're at. And it's in, I think, in, and so the question is, uh, we're one, are we just not really good at understanding and building the brakes and the ability to decelerate and the ability to, to uh, kind of attenuate some of that stress away from the ligaments to be able to absorb some of that a little bit better uh, as opposed to just selling out for for force production and not understanding how to absorb those forces better and then spread those forces out better across the body. I love that question. Yep. We're um, thanks to everything in the strength and conditioning world and uh, say athletic performance. I mean, the athletes of this generation are some of the highest quality athletes that we've ever seen I mean, in, in all sports. And there's a cost with it <clears throat> in football and Achilles tendon ruptures like that. We've all heard about it. And let's uh, get back to baseball. Uh, we can strengthen their bodies but we can't effectively strengthen ligaments the way we want to. I mean, we'd like to see the ligaments get bigger and stronger. So how, how, do, we, how do we manage this? Well, there may be some ways on how to do, say, uh, force distribution and maybe unload through proper mechanics associated with throwing and decrease it. But I don't think we're going to make that the final solution. I think the final solution that we're going to have outside of, say, velocity decreasing, which will be interesting to talk about, uh, is workload management. And that is, we talk about uh, how much you pitch, but we don't talk about how well you recover. Hey, how many times did you pitch? What's your volume? Did you exceed your pitch count? The question should often be, how did you recover? Did you sleep? Did you take care of your body in a way that allows your tissues to, uh, if they have little micro injuries to heal properly for the next time you go out? Did you have enough span of rest to go into it? And so when we have lots of workload monitoring uh, systems in place, these are wearable technologies to see what the workload is on players. And so we can monitor the workload and as you know, in uh, baseball, we're seeing a decrease in the amount of innings and pitches a starting pitcher will throw. It's because they're max effort, max velocity every pitch. Well, now we're going to decrease the number of pitches they have. That means we need more pitchers. And that means the workload on the support reliever staff is getting high. And now we're seeing all kinds of injuries in the relievers that used to be the starting pitchers. So how are we going to manage that? Well, maybe there's a time when we say we could have more pitchers or there could be a different style of the way they recover. Maybe in intervals throughout the season, a pitcher gets skipped so that they have recovery outside of just the all-star break. So, yeah, let me pause there and, and, and just uh, hear how you guys feel about it because the athlete that is so highly tuned and so good at what their athleticism is is now – putting their soft tissues at risk that are enormous. 
Well, you actually led right into my next question, Chris, because I've heard you talk quite a bit about one of the big risk factors being fatigue and that as soon as you get into a fatigue state, now you don't have those stabilizers and those things that help uh, attenuate and spread out the forces. And But often we look at this at the micro level and you're involved in, intimately with um, uh, Dr. Andrews and the Pitch Smart Commission that kind of came up with the pitch limits. And I've been in dugouts when I've, when I've been coaching baseball where the coach says, oh, well, he still has 10 pitches left, but I have to explain to him, okay, yes, that's to get to that 85 limit, whatever it is for his age. But he also pitched last Sunday and he pitched two games before and he was in a tournament last weekend. So I think we don't understand enough like you're talking about in the macro level, the overall from something that starts in February. And now you have kids, you know, with baseball playing from I had high school kids here who are in the New Jersey area who just went to a tournament. And this is the first week of March. They just went to a tournament in Alabama last weekend. Right. And now they're going to play all the way up until you know, uh, early November. So talk about fatigue on the macro level. Great, great point to bring up. Fatigue can be categorized as uh, in-season fatigue, seasonal fatigue. You just got a lot of games and it's a long season. And so towards the end of the season, maybe there's fatigue setting in. That's one part. And many athletes will start to change their workout routines as they get towards the end of the season and efforts to manage it. And we can dive into that. And there's also in-game fatigue. You're in a game, you're getting tired, but you're continuing to go. What's the effect of fatigue? Why is fatigue, uh, say, such a detriment? Because your muscles, they control the safety mechanisms of your shoulder and your elbow for the throwing athlete. So if those muscles, your rotator cuff, periscapular muscles start to not work properly and you lose synchronization because of the fatigue factor and they're not protecting your shoulder, which then leads to issues with your elbow. Uh, that's a great, great mechanism for injury. Here's the hard part about fatigue. Fatigue is hard to measure and test. There's surrogates to do it, but there's not a measure of fatigue. Like if you want to know your blood glucose level, just pick, prick a finger. You don't have to do that anymore. You know your exact blood glucose level. If you want to know what your fatigue level is, there's difficult tests to it, cortisol levels, things like that, but it's hard to measure. So you could ask somebody if they're tired and if they can keep going. Pitchers, when they're in game, they will never say, yeah, I'm tired. I'm ready. You know, I'm ready to come out, bring the other guy in. And the few times that I've seen not fatigue, but tragedies of a player saying it's getting sore it's sore right here I, i'm feeling it now and a coach may say i need two more outs you know go get them and then all of a sudden a tragedy happens and they get injured so in game fatigue we've studied it a little bit in game fatigue your mechanics start to break down your drive length driving towards home plate starts to decrease why your legs aren't working the way you want it to. If you're not driving towards home plate so well, you're not creating that momentum and then you're not transferring it to your shoulder, elbow, out to ball release, you try to make up for it. And then your arm starts to lag behind and then you put more stress on your elbow. As an example, that's in game fatigue. Seasonal fatigue is as you keep going, you're not getting enough recovery. You just can't do it. You can't get ready. You're getting tired earlier, but your expectation is, hey, I'm good for 100 pitches. And then one last thing I wanted to mention. I don't think people appreciate in our communities enough, that's the medical and performance community, mental fatigue. There's an interrelation between physical fatigue and mental fatigue and mental fatigue and physical fatigue. And to give you an example, just to bring it home, there are many top rated chess players who train physically for the endurance of a chess tournament because the physical endurance allows them greater mental endurance. And at the same time, mental fatigue, if you're mentally fatigued, if you fatigue people, like take athletes and you make them do uh, a crazy amount of geometry tests, like academic work and take a physical test and then ask them to go out and throw, 
their performance of their throwing goes down because their mental fatigue. When you lose mechanics and so forth and your performance is going down, more stress on your elbow. So if you can imagine the college kid who's going through midterms, many kids are during midterms right now, as the baseball season's going up and throwing is going up, the mental fatigue for the college athlete is, is not always appreciated. So, um, you know, we've talked about physical fatigue, mental fatigue, and, and let's sort of transition into injury prevention, right? We can sort of argue what is to blame, but we know it's a conglomeration. So let me ask you this is if you were to, you know, if you could sort of, get, you know, have a, a microphone and talk to all of the parents and all of the coaches in the world about the, the simplest way to quote unquote prevent injuries, what would that advice be? Yeah, I wish it was that simple and there was a single answer, but I uh, I'll start with this. Pain on the inside part of the elbow right here is not normal if you're a throwing athlete. And if you could have an honest relationship with your athletes, your baseball players, and it doesn't have to be just pitchers, honest meanings, encouraging a culture where you say, my elbow's hurting, that is an easy way that's in our grasp to manage injury prevention that we can be better at immediately, just like that. That's having a relationship and then acting on it. So if, a, say, a 16-year-old high school kid says, you know, the next day after I was, you know, pitching, I have pain right here, that's like a 50-year-old saying I have chest pain. You know, we don't disregard that. We make sure you get an EKG and make sure you're okay. So that kid deserves to have some level of valuation by an athletic trainer or some specialist who says, let's really understand this and make sure that you're not creating an environment that's preventable where you can get hurt. So pain is a measurable thing that we can react to. So what will be the, say, the ultimate, ultimate design of an injury prevention strategy? It's when we create a metric that is better and more celebrated than velocity. And that is a ability to get hitters out or limit score running that is not biased towards velocity. Maybe it'll always be there, but we can all name fabulous pitchers who don't have high velocities, but have a craft of deception, changing locations, changing velocities, changing the way the ball looks to a hitter. And if we call that deception, if that turns out to be more effective than just max velo, maybe that deception parameter, if that's better and people are seeking deception, they'll not throw as hard, but they're gonna throw in a way that keeps hitters off balance. By the way, uh, you know we didn't mention it, but the so-called change-up used to be thought of as an easy pitch on your elbow. Biomechanically in early studies, it sounded like it would be beneficial to have a fastball changeup repertoire. The changeup is magic if you have a good changeup. I mean, it's devastating to hitters, so we should love it. The changeup grip and the amount of pronation that goes into it turns out to be stressful. How do I know it? Players tell me it hurts when I throw my changeup. So, when you speak to players, you don't always have to go to the lab and find out. And a lot of change-ups are thrown really high because if you throw 98 and your change-up is 88, it's still a lot on your elbow. All right. So let's talk a little bit about this balance between uh, overuse versus under preparation, because we're at a really interesting time where one point, like and on one side, like you're saying is we have everybody striving for the highest exit velocity, the, the fastest 40 times, the fastest throwing times. But yet we also have a culture, especially within our kids, that is very sedentary, especially post COVID, that is not the same physical specimen that we even had 10 
especially 20 years ago, they don't have the physical resiliency. They don't have the, just the general physical preparation. They don't go out and play. So everything is, is done for them in scheduled intervals of, I have a, a, a meeting with my pitching coach. I have a meeting with my hitting coach. I have a meeting with my speed class and then they do nothing in between. And so I've seen it working with kids at the youth and high school level where they're just not the same level of physical robustness that they were 10 years ago, but yet we're asking them to do so much more with their bodies. And so we have this really, you know, you have these, th this perfect storm of things coming together and, and it kind of probably conflates the injury issue. Great, great uh, topic to discuss. I'll separate it, which separate it into two factors, preparation for a single outing. And let's just say you're a reliever and you're asked to get hot very quickly. And all of a sudden you're in the game before you're properly warmed up. That's one feature of inadequate preparation. Then all of a sudden you're on the mound and it becomes a problem. So that inability to, or um, failure to have enough time to warm up and then you're putting your body at extreme stress. That's a warm up. And I think for many young athletes, they've been accustomed to, hey, I can get ready in just a couple of minutes. But as you get older and your ability to get injured and your athleticism is very high, you need adequate time to warm up. What does that mean? You got to stretch, you got to get flexible, you got to activate your rotator cuff, you got to get your heart rate up, and you got to go through a sequencing of throws that start to get to your max effort throwing that'll happen in the game. So as you can imagine, if you were sitting in a car all day and somebody said, I need you to get out and sprint 500 yards as fast as you can, I would get hurt, pop a hamstring just like that. But if I had enough time to warm up, stretch, et cetera. The other part about getting, say, physically prepared is there's an interesting feature that I, I think we should talk about. And that is throwers have adaptations physically that develop during the times that they're growing. Those adaptations, particularly in the shoulder, are that they have increased external rotation of their shoulder. Increased external rotation allows them to wind up more. And the further you can wind up, the more launch pad you have to throw. If you have limited wind up and then you got to throw, limited wind up and then you got to throw compared to somebody who has this massive external rotation, you're stressing, you don't have enough launch pad to get the velocity and the throwing going. So how do kids acquire increased external rotation? Well, their shoulders are growing. And while you're growing, when you have these open growth plates, they're sensitive to forces. So throwers, their bones, the shoulder bone is actually rotated externally almost 20 degrees more on their throwing shoulder compared to their non-throwing shoulder. And that happens, we did some great research on this, during their phases of growing from about 12 to 15. So if you take an athlete who has never thrown before and they're 15 years old and they don't have external rotation and you say, I wanna make you a pitcher, they're gonna get hurt. So you need to throw when you're younger. They also have a little bit of soft tissue looseness which is the capsule and the structures. And that's why we don't like throwers to have anterior chest tightness, pec minor tightness, pectoralis major tightness. So we don't love for them to do, say, excessive push-ups, bench press. We like scapula back rows so that they can get into that position. So that's uh, preparing as you grow, say, through adolescence. What about preparation for the athlete who is just a slinger? I mean, he is a guy who doesn't need anything. He just takes the ball and they use this term like, I am made of rubber. My elbow is made of rubber. That only lasts so long and then it catches up with you. Core muscle strength is particularly neglected. And Eric, I'd love to hear, Mike, what you guys feel about that because I'm in your spectrum of the world now, but and some of the younger athletes who are working on breaking pitches, they sometimes neglect their core strength, but work on their leg strength and their upper body strength. And the middle ground is this area in the sequence 
that is so deficient, it becomes the denominator that is the root of problems. Well, I'll jump in with the core strength thing. I know, Mike, you have a follow-up. I think one of the big things, and this is a discussion I have to have a lot, is we think core strength is a singular thing. And so because of that, we think we can chase it with singular things like sit-ups and planks and so forth. But there's there's kind of two ends of a continuum when you talk about your core. There's one end, which is more high threshold type of bracing. If I'm going to lift something heavy, I'm going to squat, I'm going to deadlift, I'm going to do lift something. I have to produce a ton of force. Then there's on the other end of the continuum, there's more of a control and stabilization that's more about coordination. And that's how we our right hand connects to our left leg and how we run and sync everything across our bodies. And if you don't have that synchronization, and even more important, the timing of it, that when someone throws, if you look at, and, and you guys collect all this data, when you're looking at motion capture and you're looking at the sequencing, it do they start from the ground, initiate from the pelvis and then through the trunk and then through the shoulder and through the arm, it's that sequencing and not so much how strong they are but how well coordinated they are that it attenuates that force properly well if they start with the arm well the core is already out it's it's already out of the race and so it doesn't matter how many planks you could do or how many sit-ups you could do you've already lost that because it's a coordination problem i think that's such a great point and um, that's why in many ways the person with the uh, say the highest velocity he's not the person who can say have the max ben bench press on the team there's something different about how they sequence their muscles very efficiently and that is the so-called kinetic chain and that kinetic chain feature is sequencing the muscles so i love um, i love that point eric and i think some of the best athletes uh, sometimes make it look effortless you know that because they just have such an optimization of timing principles everything starting from the legs with an amazing foundation of leg strength and coordination that sequences up through the chain that finally allows you to release and have effectiveness with also hopefully not over uh, taxing your elbow. And that's where fatigue comes in too, because if in the link you have a deficiency in one area and that part fatigues, then the whole system is going to break down. Hey, everybody, a quick break in the action here. Hope you're enjoying the show and we appreciate you listening. We're working hard to bring you the highest quality content and best guests every single week. So if you could do us a big favor and go and like and subscribe to the show on whatever platform you get your podcasts on, it would be greatly appreciated. Be sure to listen at the end of the show also to find out more information about our courses, as well as a special discount code for all our listeners. Thanks again, and let's get back to the show. Something you said earlier, Doc, and I want to sort of follow up. You had mentioned that um, that you had noticed that athletes that basically were throwing in those sort of adolescent ages, and I said you, I think you said between uh, thirteen and fifteen had sort of this adaptation of a twenty degree externally rotated humerus. Correct. So. I think about that, then I think about sort of the windows of trainability. And when we look at development and peak height velocity, uh, peak height velocity and all the other things that go into that. So, um, it, you know, one of the things that we've seen over the years, and, and you just basically sort of solidified that thought process, this is what you do as a kid and what you do consistently over time will give you functional adaptations down the road. And it just shows, I mean, think about like stress fractures and uh, gymnasts, right? I mean, you see that all the time as well. So it's it's really interesting to see that, you know, when you're saying that we see this adaptation of 20 degrees, that it falls in line with the whole developmental model and where we have those windows of trainability and where we have those sweet spots where we can really, you know, have that window to focus on maybe developing particular qualities. But I just thought it was really interesting to see that. And um, is that something that you guys did recently as far as that research? Well, the, the research exists for this external rotation parameter. And in fact, having limited external rotation of your shoulder is related to UCL injuries. It's correlated to it. So if you don't have enough external rotation, it's just one of many risk factors. And once you're at a certain age, it's you can no longer change the bone. You can change the soft tissues. So we'll get back to weighted balls. Weighted balls, in fact, do increase velocity. That's proven, that's a given. How does it do it? Well, you would think it increases your strength of the system, 
to throw a heavier ball. In actuality, what it does is it increases your external rotation. It gives you more of that rotational arc. And how does it do it? It stretches the soft tissues. And stretching is one polite way of saying you're getting more tissue compliance. An impolite way is saying is you're tearing it. So if you go too far, you tear the tissues and you don't stretch it. So I like the idea of um, at a younger age, creating a systematic approach and a framework of hygiene. Because in this country, we are actually very good at dental hygiene. And we got fluoride in the water. We got regular tooth checkups and stuff like that. When was the last time you went for a routine elbow checkup? Like you don't get routine elbow checkups, but we do it because there's a effect of prevention for tooth decay, which is measurable and it's great. It's one of the best things we are. And that is dental hygiene. So when it comes to baseball, shoulder and elbow hygiene, that's starting at the earliest ages of how you maintain flexibility, have appropriate muscle strength throughout your body, throughout the kinetic chain, manage fatigue properly, et cetera, sleep right. All of that goes into the hygiene of keeping your shoulder healthy. So I think you make some great points. The research that we published uh, is uh, maybe about 15 years old and it was empiric. We basically took a whole bunch of young athletes of different age categories. And what we saw is that when you're 10 years old, your, both your shoulders rotate the same amount. When you're 13, you start to see a little bit increase on the dominant side. And by the time you're 15, you got it. And after 15, 16, that's what you got. You don't get any more from the amount of uh, rotation that you have. So in many ways, uh, uh, if, if you want to throw and you want to be a hard thrower, you have to start at a reasonable age. And uh, I'll ask you guys this. It gets back to uh, Eric's challenge in the and how we manage the kid who has an incredible growth spurt. He's six foot four and he weighs 120 pounds, that kid. And he's all length in his arms and wingspan and legs. And he does not have the catch up yet of his muscular physicality, but because he's lengthy, he has lever arms and he's the best on the team. So he gets used a lot and now he's getting sore. How do you guys manage that athlete? Yeah, so so that is education with uh, with the parents. And I explain that, I always, my analogy with that, Chris, I call him, said, you know what you are? You are the shiny toy. You're the shiny toy in your coach's uh, uh, um, toolbox and he can't wait to show off that shiny toy. And it happens not just in baseball. I have it, and especially in softball, I've seen it because softball, you generally only have one stud pitcher, especially at the high school level. And so they want to bring out that stud every chance they get. And I've had some really high level softball pitchers who, you know, were playing in a tournament this time of year where it's cold and 40 degrees and rainy here in the Northeast. And they go into a tournament and they said, oh, I thought I was going to see so-and-so pitch. And they're like, oh, get up and throw. And they just bring out their shiny toy to show her off. And next thing you know, her shoulder's barking because she didn't have the time to prepare for that outing. And so I have to say, you have to you have to fight against being used as that shiny toy. And then on the, on the back end, we have to prepare them to be as physically robust as possible within that situation and as possible and get them. And the biggest thing, because they're waking up with new body every day is they don't know how to coordinate it. It's the biggest thing is training their nervous system much more than the hardware. It's much more the software of learning how to control all this, that, that length that they have to deal with. Great points. And, uh, and you mentioned softball, there's new populations that are coming out with uh, UCL injuries. And <laughs> that is the softball. Player. And it's not the pitcher necessarily because the windmill underhand pitching is not as stressful, not nearly as stressful to the UCL, but the position players are now entering their UCL because as a position player in softball, you're expected to throw, you know, extremely hard. So we would never have predicted 10 years ago that softball players are getting MRIs on their elbows and getting Tommy John surgery. 
All right. So early on, I mentioned that that in, in our performance and strength and conditioning, we almost are too good. Sometimes we make them too strong and powerful that their soft tissue systems can't hold up. And so there's a downside to, to being a little too good at what we do. Now, there's also been some incredible advancements, and you've been on the cutting edge of advancements on ACL and UCL surgical procedures. And obviously, that's a huge benefit to the patient. But there's also a little bit of a dark side to that in that People, t what I've seen is athletes almost take it a little bit more lightly in that they're almost coming to you sometimes and asking for UCL surgeries when they're not even injured because they think it's going to boost their performance because they see their favorite pitcher came back and was better after UCL surgery. Or the other point is uh, I wrote an, an article uh, a bunch of years back when Adrian Peterson uh, tore his ACL and I said how he ruined ACL sur ACL rehab for every professional out there because he came back in nine months and almost broke the rushing record. And I have to explain to the high school running back that, look, you're not, he's one of the greatest running backs ever. He's a freak, number one. He has round the clock treatment. You're going to your local physical therapist and, and you can't expect to have the same timeline as someone who's this complete outlier. So talk about where sometimes we we're not as apprehensive as we should be about these major surgical procedures because you've gotten so good at them. Yeah. Great points. Uh, first I'm i uh, I'm an engineer by training and I've studied the surgical technique of Tommy John surgery for the last 25 years. And I do maybe 10 Tommy John's uh, surgeries a week, the way the volume is right now. And uh, so my goal has always been to improve the technique. Before I talk about how great the surgery is becoming, I definitely want to pause for a second and because uh, there's a bias on the results of Tommy John surgery. And that is when you're watching a game and you see a player that's on the mound and doing well, the amount of times that they say this player had Tommy John surgery and he's doing great is enormous. The reason why we only hear about the great results is because the player who didn't get good enough, who didn't succeed, he's not on TV anymore. We never hear about that player. So we have this we call it sensationalism of Tommy John surgery because there's a bias within the world of athletes. The ones who make it back are the ones that are celebrated. The ones who don't come back, we don't hear about anymore. They're lost and forgotten. The other pa part about Tommy John surgery that uh, people are aware of but don't appreciate it till you're in it is the amount of recovery effort after the surgery, the post-surgical rehab, the operation takes about 45 minutes to an hour. The recovery time can take you from 10 months to 18 months, and that's working essentially every day for over a year for a 45-minute operation. And so that burden of physical work that you have to do where you're not playing yet uh, is also psychologically impactful. You know, you lose motivation. You just lose the desire because it's so much effort and you're not getting the, say, rewards of being with your team and so forth. So I've been working on that as a psychological impact. And we studied that the psychological impact for some athletes who sustain a UCL injury, a typical example would be today, if a high school junior injures his UCL today, and I saw a whole bunch of them this week earlier, their recruitment to college is devastated because they can't play their junior year in high school and get recruited. They can't play in the summer. And by the time they get back, they're a senior. It'll be the summer. Then they have all kinds of changes they have to do in their career. That psychological impact is the equivalent of what soldiers experience when they're exposed to military atrocity that creates post-traumatic stress. And how do I know that? Because we studied it and we found that the psychological impact is enormous. So how do we manage that? Well, we're working on it and we're developing resiliency tools. And in fact, in the military now, post-traumatic stress disorder is going down because resiliency tools are getting implemented and used and they can be very effective in having people manage cope with injury. So that's the uh, player who's devastated by it. There's the other athlete who says, my velo is not good enough. 
I'm not advancing the way other players are. I am looking for enhancement. And uh, sometimes that's, let me, let me get an operation. Maybe that'll make it better because everyone I know has had the operation is throwing well. And that of, uh, you know, that's a problem. And uh, I wrote a piece on it after I did some research on it where uh, I studied parents' impact on, and players' impact on it. And they called it the next student steroid that is getting Tommy John surgery. Let me talk to you about the advances now that we put that into perspective. The advancement that is, I think people are aware of now is a repair operation where traditional Tommy John surgery is take a tendon from your forearm, transplant it to your elbow, and that tendon becomes a new and stronger ligament and replaces your old ligament. So you get a brand new one. You change out the engine and it's a bigger, faster engine. The repair operation is let's fix the engine that's inside the elbow. Let's fix the ligament and not repair, uh, not remove it and replace it. And that's by stitching it up and sewing it up. And then we put a brace on it. It's like a little tiny seat belt that goes inside your elbow. And it's made of a material that your body likes. Body loves it. Body tolerates it. And it acts like a check rein. So if your elbow is about to see too much stress, boom, your seatbelt comes into effect and it protects it. So that's been a great advancement because the recovery time is less. It's about eight months, sometimes six months for that operation, which can be ben better, uh, very beneficial for certain athletes for their timing if they need to get back. Let's just say you're hurt as a sophomore and you want to get back for your junior year in high school. All of a sudden, we got a new option for you to get you back, which is great. The thing to know about it is it's technically demanding. It's a very tricky operation. And so next week I'm converting two repair operations that did not work out. And it didn't work out because it had some issues with it. So it's a tricky operation, but it's great when it's done correctly. The second part of it to understand that um, maybe not appreciated is not everybody's a candidate. Why wouldn't everybody do it? Uh, you have to have a ligament that is overall healthy, except for a focal, like in a singular area that's damaged. Then you're a good candidate for it. And if you're a good candidate and it's done well, the results are as good as Tommy John surgery. The durability, like how long it lasts, but we still got to study that a little bit. And then that repair with the internal brace, that seatbelt device, here is the major advancement in the last few years. That is, you can get Tommy John surgery, get your native ligament repaired, and get the internal brace put in also. So that's Tommy John plus protection. And that tends to make a smoother recovery. It makes your timeline to full pitching perhaps shorter. And I can tell you anecdotally in my experience, I have players that would normally be back at 12 and 14 months. I got players coming back this spring who had that operation, Tommy John replacement with an internal brace, coming back this season, getting cleared in March to play, and they're only nine, 10 months out from surgery, which is amazing. So as we sort of wind this thing down, I want to talk about quickly about parents because, um, you know, parents are a big part of this whole situation. And, and you know, we run into people on opposite ends of the spectrum, right? We have people that are like rub some dirt in it. Meanwhile, they've got like an arm popping out, you know, and then they've got other people that like when little Billy sneezes too hard, he's like, it hurts. Right. So, so the question I have for you is, is uh, you had mentioned obviously like pain on the inside of the elbow, but let's talk about the entire body. Um, you know, what advice uh, should we give parents uh, on how to talk to their kids to see whether or not it's just normal wear and tear or if it's just, wow, something uh, needs to be looked at a little bit deeper. Do you have any insight or recommendations on that? Yeah, great, great question, because it goes along a spectrum where soreness, which is normal, and pain on the other side of the uh, spectrum, which is a problem, there's an in-between gray zone. And how do you figure out that in-between gray zone? Uh, it's, uh, it's challenging. I'll tell you this though, if you know your player, you know your athlete, you know your child, uh, and you know 
um, what their behavior patterns are and what their pain tolerances are, like a kid who never complains and all of a sudden he complains, you'll take that seriously. I'll give you an example. In my time with the Yankees over the last 15 years, there's a player who, if he came to me and said he had a issue, it was serious. That player is Derek Jeter. I mean, he didn't complain unless, and if he did, it was time to take a good look at it. Now, other players who say, I got a something here, I got a something there, it's kind of part of their routine. It's part of their body and their makeup and their expression of it. And we get to know them and we don't disregard it, but we don't weight it as heavily. Then we fall on to, if they're in my presence, physical examination. If you're a parent, how do you do that? Well, number one, if it's sore for a day, usually it's not a problem and it goes away within 24 hours. If it's lasting more than 48 hours, like my shoulder hurts more than 48 hours, that's a signal that something is problematic, deserves a little bit of attention. And often if it's a location like this or this in a throwing athlete, we err on the side of caution. So you may want to be just a little bit overly sensitive. And my favorite patient in the office is when I can examine someone and say, I'm glad you came in today. You look great. You can throw this weekend. You know, that's, that's part of it. Uh, so it's the location. If it's concerning shoulder and elbow, that's different. If you have a little bit of say thigh soreness because you ran so much, that's muscular. That's okay. But if it hurts here, it could be ligament. If it hurts here, it could be labrum. And those could become problems that then need an operation or an extended timeout. And it's severity, like this is 10 out of 10 pain versus two out of 10 pain and how long it lasts. If it lasts more than 48 hours, location, severity, duration. Awesome. Well, Chris, we can definitely keep you all day, but as I mentioned earlier, you're one of the busiest men on the planet. And so before we wrap up, let's, let's see what's on the agenda uh, coming up for you. I know you're involved in, in pro soccer, right? You're just the, the uh, team physician also, I forgot to mention for, for NYFC. Um, and so you have the Yankees, you have, you know, your writing, you have your academic work, you have your private practice, anything else you're going to add into the, into the mix this, this year, or, or is that enough to keep you busy? Well, I, um, uh, thanks for opening the door. I have uh, two things I'd love to share with you as, as we wrap up. The first is, uh, I think we should celebrate the inventor of Tommy John surgery, and his name is Frank Job. He was a team physician for the Dodgers. And when Tommy John hurt his elbow, MRI did not even exist. It was a diagnosis made by physical exam alone. And Frank Job told Tommy John that his career was over. And Tommy John said, I don't accept that. I want you to invent an operation for me. And Job said, I think you have one in a hundred chance of coming back. And, uh, and Tommy John said, I'll take it. They created the operation. It was performed in 1974. And Tommy John, of course, had a successful career following the surgery. He pitched more than before the surgery. He became a New York Yankee. We've had lots of uh, great conversations over the years and the reason why it's called Tommy John surgery and not a Frank Job operation is because when Frank Job was explaining it to people, he would call it the ulnar collateral ligament reconstruction of the elbow with ipsilateral palmaris longus graft. Now, that's a big thing to say, and he was getting tired of trying to spit that out all the time. So he said the operation I did on Tommy John. And Frank Job, while uh, is so humble, he often remarked that he wished he was better at it because he could have saved Sandy Koufax's year if he learned how to do this earlier. So I was fortunate enough to train with uh, Dr. Frank Job. He taught me how to do the operation. And of course, we discussed its evolution. The final thing is uh, my interest in performance is beyond... Um, say taking care of athletes, it has to do uh, with my personal surgical performance. And I work on my personal surgical performance like an athlete works on their performance or a chess player works on their chess game or a musician works in their music. And I've taken a lot of these principles that I've adapted from working with some of these very talented people 
and I'm writing my second book. First book was called Skill. My second book is completed. I just got to get it published and available. And it's called The Anatomy of Performance. Look forward to sharing it with you guys soon. That's exceptional. And, and, uh, Chris is always my first go-to when I unfortunately have that situation who has an, uh, uh, an individual who needs uh, some orthopedic uh, intervention. And actually just uh, ironically, Chris, I saw one of our, uh, one of my referrals over to you who you did his ACL, who's going, he's leaving tomorrow to get ready for his spring season in Europe as a professional football player. And he's doing awesome. So uh, I can't recommend it enough and I can't thank you enough for your time. This has been awesome and uh, greatly appreciated. And want to thank everybody for listening. And this has been the principles of Performance performance podcast thanks guys thank you for listening to the principles of performance podcast if you've enjoyed our content please like and share on your social media outlets as well as subscribe and give us a review on youtube apple Podcasts, or whatever your preferred platform is to listen to for more information on the principles of program design courses and workshops visit us at www.principlesofprogramdesign.com and follow us on all of the social media channels where we post new content every day. To save 10% on any PPD courses, enter the discount code PRINCIPLESPODCAST10 at checkout. If you have any questions we can answer or suggestions for the show, you can email us at info at principlesofprogramdesign.com or message us on social media. Thank you again for your support.